Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. Thanks for joining me tonight. It's checking out the video game industry in a totally different way and a new way. Welcome everyone to 1981. We are in the summer of 1981 and we last left off with, I would argue, as the best space shooter we played thus far. It had color vector graphics, it had full speech, it had aliens talking to us, it had transformation and upgrades and the gameplay was smooth, flawless, and sound fantastic. And that was Space Fury, the last game we played. Let's see what our next release is after Space Fury. Oh yes, okay, this is fantastic. This is Castle Wolfenstein for the Apple II. The first release we've seen, um, actually no, Silas Warner has uh, graced us with a couple other releases on the Apple II. This is the, the, the first Castle Wolfenstein, obviously, but uh, Muse Software, we've seen, I think this is the third release on the Apple II. All right, so let's see the artwork and check out Castle Wolfenstein for Apple II. Here is, oh, there, there's nothing right there. Here is the front of the box. There we go, Muse Software by Apple II. You can also see it's for Commodore 64 and 128, which uh, doesn't exist yet. But uh, this was a, for the original Apple II. And we have the back of the box. There we go. World War II rages across Europe. Castle Wolfenstein is occupied by the Army of the Reich and converted into Battlefront headquarters. You've been captured and brought to the castle for interrogation by the dreaded SS. From a hiding place beyond the stones of a dungeon, a dying cellmate produces a Mauser M98 pistol fully loaded with 10 bullets and gives it to you. Your new mission. Find the Nazi war plans and escape Castle Wolfenstein alive. Castle Wolfenstein's an action-adventure game from Muse demanding fast thinking and quick manual response. Use paddle, game paddles, whoa, you can use the game paddles for this, joystick, or your computer keyboard. Castle Wolfenstein generates an unlimited variety of castle layouts, each more difficult to escape than the last. And I believe that means this is a procedurally generated castle, i.e. Uh, like the roguelikes we've seen, but this one's on a much grander scale. And there's just more artwork for us. Really excited about this one. I forgot this was 1981. So there you go. There's our five and a quarter floppy disk by Silas Warner. He eventually sold the rights to id software and that's why we got wolfenstein 3d but this is the original the granddaddy and there's the uh, alternate example i bet this is the the first box same uh, description that we read earlier though and there's an example of the screenshot oh this is excellent okay so here we go we got the manual for castle wolfenstein uh looks like uh yeah there have some some things crossed out the original was Apple II, so this looks like the another release that came a little bit later. Because at this time, there wasn't a Commodore 64 for uh, the alternate uh, play ways you could play. So as we scroll through after table of contents, we got introduction, yes, World War II, and to tell you the truth, the, the, the description they're giving for this sounds like a game you'd play today. Like, uh... You're 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 in a castle. It's World War II, um, kind of what we've seen with like the modern day Call of Duty games. That's what it feels like. And then you're the only one left. You have one gun, and then uh, it's adding elements that we haven't seen on the home home computer. We've seen this for role playing games, but not to the scope of you know they're giving you a limited am ammunition, and then you have to make your way through a castle. That's procedurally generated, and then you have ways that you can sneak by guards. You don't have to run around guns blazing. It's a combination of an, uh, I don't want to say adventure, but it's a combination of a role-playing and action game. Yeah, your mission, find the war plans and escape Castle Wolfenstein alive. So to play this, uh, you begin on the lowest level of the castle, and you always start in the same castle until you escape from it or unless you generate a new one. So every time that you boot the game up, it's going to create a seed that gen generates that castle that you're in. And then when you play the game, it continues to generate that same a seed or same castle until you say make a new one. It's going to build a whole new one up for you. Each room at the castle has at least one doorway. And that leads to an adjoining room or stairway that leads to another level of the castle. When you roam from room to room trying to find the chest that contains the war plans... And the doorway to freedom, you'll have to shoot your way past guards and SS stormtroopers. You can replenish your supply of bullets and acquire other supplies by searching guards and opening supply chests. 
If you search a dread or sur surrender guard and find some items that you need, you'll automatically be transferred to your supply. However, your bullet clip will be swapped with the guard's clip only if he has more bullets than you. You'll need to move quickly, so you'll be limited to a maximum of 10 bullets, 3 grenades, keys, a bulletproof vest, a uniform, and war plans for Operation Rheingold. This is uh, actually a, a very... Uh, uh, a game that Silas Warner wanted to make. It, and, and we see this with developers. If a developer has an idea in their head, they want to recreate this and make this game. This was his dream game. This is Silas Warner's like, I want to make a game that plays like this. So uh, I forget the total development time that he spent on this. Uh, I know it was over a year and he, he, he finally made this happen. And this, this is, this is the kind of game that you wouldn't expect from 1981 with the, the level of complexity it has. So we hear it, we have an example of the screenshot and they're breaking everything down. So the, the view is uh, slightly top down. It's one room at a time, doesn't scroll. And uh, uh, you, have, you, know, you have the doorway, you have the guard. It uh, looks like what, uh, what the dead guard looks like. And then uh, you know what you are, who, who you play as, what the doors look like, stairs and so forth. But it's um, uh, an excellent way to view the game and play the game. And then you have different promotions. When you succeed in escaping the castle, you can get uh, like ranks, private, corporal, sergeant, lieutenant. And uh, I think it's depending on how fast. If you succeed, there we go. Yeah, each kind of castle that you escape from, you get a rank higher if you're able to do it. And then we also have, uh, in, they translate the German words because I believe the guards are going to talk to us. We're going to hear them say these things. Achtung, halt, folgen. And it has the like translation of what they're be, be yelling at us in English. So for the Apple, uh, it shows us how to load there. But for game controls, this is where it gets interesting. Keyboard is going to control with the um, uh, QE, ASD, ZXC, and then you move and can aim separately. So it's it's uh, not necessarily dual stick, but it's the first time that we're we're, we're separating the, the the two controls. The only other time we've seen this so far on the channel has been in the arcade. With uh, lunar, um, with the uh, asteroid killer comet, where we had the ship moving in other directions, and while the ship was moving, we were able to fire in different ways. Hey, welcome, RK Jeff. We're checking out Wolfenstein Castle Wolfenstein, the very first release in 1981 by Silas Warner. And anyone else that's joining us as well, we can also play with the joystick or crazy enough, the paddles. Uh, we will not be playing with the paddles, but th they're making it so you can have two paddles. You use one to uh, move around and then one to fire your gun in different directions. Incredible. Uh, that is, uh, that's that's probably one of, one of the most innovative ways of using controllers so far. We've seen uh, at home. Uh, two at once and able to aim and move at the same time. Um, so that's th that's extremely innovative. And then they see we have more controls for like uh, throwing grenades, opening chests. Uh, terminating, and then space bar is how you can search guards, unlock doors and chests. But we do have, yeah, throwing grenades, opening chests, and uh, of course saving where we are in the game. Yeah, starting off, it shows you exactly how to load and then play. And then uh, if you're playing on, yeah, this is if you're playing on Atari. We're going to be doing the original. This is so the this manual is for when it was released a second time. It was it was also for Atari and Commodore. So that has that, that's why it has these other examples of controls. But uh, there we go. And we also have the IBM PC and PC Junior controls, which we haven't seen those yet. So we'll skip by those and look at the manual if we need to. And I'm rambling on about the controls and the. Um, uh, hey, welcome, Bubsy2345. I'm rambling about the controls, but a lot of times we see with these home computer releases, they may not boot. So hopefully we can get this game to load up. And you can see we got different versions we can play. Uh, I believe we want to go for this one. Let's see if this one loads for us. So it is June 17th, 1981, and we're playing Castle Wolfenstein by Mew Software, or more specifically, Silas Warner's dream game that he wanted to make yes okay we got it to load so here we go castle wolfenstein 1981 and let's do it we're playing so our rank right now is corporal what controls do you want we're going to try for the joystick controls uh i don't have two paddles plugged into my apple II right now so we'll go with joystick and see how this runs Welcome to Castle Wolfenstein, mate. The Nazis brought you here to get information out of you before they kill you. Oh, and it went to the next screen before I get here to read it. <laughs> we are playing on an enhanced Apple II that's going even faster, so it makes sense. Be careful because every room in the castle is guarded. The regular guards can't leave their post without orders, but watch out for the SS stormtroopers. They're the ones in the bulletproof vest and they're like bloody hounds. Once you picked up their trail, 
once they picked up your trail, they won't stop chasing you. So that means we have enemies that are even going to chase us in the game. Castle Wolfenstein's full of supplies, too. I know one chap who found a whole German uniform and almost sneaked out past the guards. He might have made it if he hadn't shot some poor sod. Oh, if he hadn't got shot. One more thing. The battle plans for Operation Rheingold are hidden somewhere in the castle. I'm sure you know what it would mean at the Allied High Command if we could get our hands on those. They're coming for me. Good luck. Ah! So we are dead. Oh, here we go. I'm in. Oh! <laughs> It looks like the walls are electrified. Oh my gosh, and the flashing. The flashing's crazy. Apologies for anybody that is sensitive to flashing. Please close one eye. Uh, they did not program games for, for people of that sensitivity. Yeah, you bet they got me. I'm, I'm beyond dead. So they're doing the wall similar to Berserk, which I wonder if this was uh, Berserk was an inspiration. We saw that in the arcades with single screen uh, walls you move around from the top down view. And so now we have Castle Wolfenstein doing that and the walls are electrified as well. Okay, so trying it again with joysticks. Looks like C was to reverse the controls. And so while it's doing this, it's uh, it's giving us the the explanation like it did before, but it's telling the, the, the game in the background is loading the current castle that is in memory and uh, that's why it's going through this script and telling us like this this person that is, it left us with a gun and, and giving us the information and give us a little story too we always get that on the home computers way more story than the arcade but this is one of those games that uh like like the role-playing games you can really dive in and get involved so much in the game it's it's fantastic yeah so someone found a chest of explosives so we might be able to find those uh, bombs that they were talking about in the manual. All right, so trying it again. I'm gonna have to get my gun out and make sure I'm ready for this guy. So you notice I started in a different place. I don't think he sees me though. Okay, so if I want to check this chest, do I walk into? Okay, so I walk. Oh, I think he saw me. So I have uh, ten bullets, and if I want to aim my gun, I have to. Oh wow! If you touch the chest, you get electrified. I don't have a health bar or anything, but I just know... <laughs> no, how did they get me? I didn't think they got me that time. Well, looks like I'm not very good at killing Nazis on Castle Wolfenstein. We'll go for joysticks again. We also have keyboard controls. I'll give that a shot if the joystick is uh, not working as well. And so it looks like uh, we do have, in this game, stormtroopers that won't stop chasing us until we kill them. So uh, we might need a grenade to take those guys out. But wow, what an ambitious game for everything that it could do. And it's fascinating that whenever ID Software got the, the rights to this game, they originally were going to make it the same way, where you could sneak around, uh, get uniforms off of guards, and uh, do the same kind of espionage or, or, or uh, uh, stealth mechanics but then they found out it was just uh, slowing the game down so they got rid of everything and made it just you know first person shooter action guns blazing okay here we go so try it again can I go no he killed me oh my gosh so if you saw I pulled my gun out but I didn't fire fast enough they put me in a different position or the game begins a different way every time and so whenever we uh, start it looks like the, the controls did work correctly Let's do control C and then try there. Oh, we can program our joystick. That's awesome. Okay, let's try it. And upper right. Nice. Joystick programming. That's awesome. In 1981. Because it did feel a little off, but I'm going to try on keyboard as well. But I pulled my gun out and because I didn't fire fast enough, the guard popped me and then boom, I was dead that fast. It is going to be different every time that you start this. The the placement of where you begin and then where the guards are, everything's going to be uh, a different uh, playing different. So it's really cool that we're playing a roguelike, and every other roguelike we've played so far on the channel has been. Oh, well, speaking of which, we haven't even seen Rogue yet. Uh, even though we we call them roguelikes, the the video game Rogue hasn't been released yet, or or we haven't seen it yet on the channel. And so when, the other roguelikes we've seen, though, we were a blip. We were one pixel on the screen. Okay, here we go. Try it again. We can do it. I believe in us. If I get started in the same spot... Okay, there we go. All right, let me practice my gun. Yeah. 
Yeah, I can point it, but I can't fire it. I know I have 10 bullets. Ah, oh, I alerted him. Here he comes. Yes! Okay, we shot him. Okay, so the way it works is you have to aim the gun while you're aiming. Then you have to hold... Wait, first of all, you have to hold down the gun button. While you're holding the gun button down, then you aim. Then after you aim, you have to hit the shoot button. So at the same time, so it's almost three different buttons you have to uh, scroll through. No! So if you go too close to the chest, it like electrifies me. All right, let's try it again. Don't go too close. What? <laughs> and then the screen goes crazy and flashes. So let's try to open the chest up. Looks like it won't let me open, but we can search this guard and see what we find. So you can search bodies. You can also, yeah, so we got three bullets and we got keys from this guy. So that's good. And I'm going to refer back to the manual because I thought chest was a certain button, but that's why we got the manual so we can see. All right, so going back here, we want to see what it is. It looks like, oh, use contents of a chest. But to open a chest is, oh, space bar. Oh, that's right. We need a key. That's why. Okay, so now that we got the key, we should be able to open the chest. So let's give this a shot. Without getting too close and being electrified. Do we have to, oh, do we have to use the key though? So we have to pull over inventory and then use the key to open the chest. So back to the manual, going to instruction, and we're looking for how to get, aim your gun at the chest. Oh, and press space bar. Oh, okay. So you aim your gun and that's how you unlock chests. <laughs> okay. That wasn't as intuitive. So here we go. Aim the gun and open. Oh my gosh, and it's gonna take 145 seconds to open the chest? What, what if, but if I have a key, is there a way to open it faster? Oh my gosh, did they make you wait that long? Well, thankfully we have this. Uh, I got a uh, way, way to speed up my... <laughs> so we have a fast forward key. Uh, there we go. To wait that long though? <laughs> <laughs> and then right after I was waiting, I still walk into the chest and get electrocuted. Okay, here we go. So we searched the body we found inside the chest, and then we can go check these two. I hope it doesn't take as long. So same idea, aim and search. Aim and fire. No, I just wasted three bullets. <laughs> Am I supposed to be able to get closer? Let's try it like this. Aim and fire. Or maybe I just used the key that uh, the other guard had dropped, and now I can't open any other chests? <laughs> it's so finicky, because this is like a berserk. You could touch the walls and get electrocuted, so it's the same thing here. Wow, 200 seconds to open this one up? Wow, oh my gosh. Okay, so let's do it again. Going in. Fast forward. So in 1981, we, we already know that we have to wait longer to load these games, but to play the game, you would have to await that many seconds in real time. That's just torture. Bratwurst. So I can use Bratwurst. That's awesome. 22 seconds though? Why would I want to get used 22 seconds for it? All right, so I'm moving back away from the chest. Let's get rid of the gun. And then let's go to the next level in Wolfenstein. So this is the first game. Oh, wait. He's coming. I'm ready now. I know how to use my gun, buddy. Come out. Oh, he just surrendered. So here, I can search him. <laughs> We're touching a guard. Oh, they caught me. Okay, so touching chests, touching walls, touching guards uh, makes the screen go crazy, flash and everything. <laughs> yeah, right. We couldn't eat him at first. So you have to be a little more sensitive about what you touch and, and move to. But I had the ability to search that guard. And if I wanted to, I could take things from them. Or if I had enough bullets, I could sh shoot them. Because you can take the chance of just aiming the gun and seeing if their hands go up like, you know, I surrender. But uh, this is unheard of in 1981 to be able to have this many options for a home computer game and look like this with uh, characters this large on, on the screen. So... Um, well, it's a little bit harder for myself to get into. It's because I'm, I'm thinking of it from playing from a modern game. But back then, this is a game that you'd be able to spend a lot of time on, have a lot of fun with, 
and, and do more than you could with other games. The only other ones I can think of that we played so far on the channel was the roguelikes, where we were one pixel making decisions as, as a role-playing game. But this one is you, you're a character. Uh, you, you can see yourself. You can see the other people uh, that, you're, that you're working with, and it has a, a great story, the, the whole stealth mechanic. And this is... Um, I'm trying to think of any other games where we're doing stealth. I have to be, I have to make it stretch if I wanted to say like Lupin Three in the arcade. But this is one of the first that does that. So uh, this one's up there with how how good it is. It is not average. It is above average. It's higher than a four star game. This <laughs> I feel like I'm deep beating a dead horse trying to go all the way five again because I've had so many games uh, that we played on the channel that have been so good. But Castle Wolfenstein is another one of those games that is fr from everything else that we played. It's it's one of the best, if not the best, computer game you could play at the time. Now, again, we're, we're not doing it on a bias of genre. It's just the, 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 the work that was put into it and what you were able to accomplish and how you play it. So while the gameplay is a little stiff, it's playing better than as one pixel as a roguelike moving around. And the voice. Yes, we heard guards talking. Uh, so it's uh, we're, we're now getting games that talk to us in the arcades first. And this year, we're starting to see computers talk to us. But it's still... Um, with, with all the mechanics that are in place and how long this took to make, while I, I, I would uh, fault it for like, you know, the electric walls and electric chests and players or the other uh, Nazis that you come across, but it's, it's still something that once you get used to the controls, it's, it, it's, it's, it's what you can play it well. And you have paddle controls too. It, it, it's, it's revolutionizing moving and shooting at the same time. So we're going to go five stars for Castle Wolfenstein. It is that good for 1981. All right, so after Castle Wolfenstein, what is our next release? All right, now we're going to check out Jump Bug in the arcades. Let's take a look at the artwork for Jump Bug. This is by Rock Ola. Oh, okay, so Hoi was the original developer, I'm guessing. But uh, there's the advertisement flyer for Jump Bug. Nice. Very cartoonish, love it. And there's our arcade cabinet, Jump Bug, like we're playing as a beetle that can jump, I guess. There's our control panel, looks like it's an eight-way joystick, okay, with, uh, oh, we can fire, we're going to shoot while we're driving the bug around, all right. Yeah, so controls are just moving around and firing. There's the arcade marquee, Rock Ola was the one that distributed it, most likely Hoi was the one that developed it. And there's the example of the screenshot. We have no manual for it, but for different versions, we have a bootleg version. We're going to play the original. Here we go. It is June 19th, 1981, and this is Jump Bug by Hoi in the arcades. First time checking this one out, we're going to see what the attract mode is like. Yeah, so it's a, a side-scrolling shooter. What is with 1981 and side-scrolling? We hadn't seen any any horizontal scrolling shooters until 1981, and then we get Scramble that shows up, and then we get Defender that shows up, and now there's all these other uh, horizontal scrolling games in the arcades, at least. We haven't seen uh, at the home space. We haven't seen things scrolling horizontally, but uh, it, I don't know what it is with 1981 and scrolling horizontally. But uh, let's put a quarter in and push start. <laughs> Nice, got a little ditty for us. Oh wow, the controls are cool. It's um, I'm moving the joystick to move the. That's how I jump. The joystick is how I move the the, the car around. Oh okay, I'm not supposed to hit the Joker, I guess. <laughs> but it's a uh, auto scroller, so it's uh, moving to the left as if I was a, a spaceship like the other ones. But no, I'm a car, and I get to jump from building to building. And oh, obviously avoid that guy with the skull. We didn't get the manual, so I don't know what they're technically called. Yes, the jump mechanic. That's that's a good point. We've had 2D scrolling games on the show. And uh, the first one I can think of was Cheeky Mouse. And then we also had... Um, after Cheeky Mouse, we had Space Panic. But there was no jumping. It was a, a side view like this. But this is the first... Uh, game we've been able to jump. It's not the same jump mechanic you think, though. It's not pushing a button to jump. It's oh, we get to put our score, our uh, our initials in. That's awesome. Can I move? Oh, okay. It uses this. And then the the other games that we've seen on the side view, they didn't have a jump mechanic. But the jumping here is we have to push up on the joystick. So if any um, anybody in Europe or the UK. 
Oh, it's backwards. Are familiar with the the, the, the systems or uh, microcomputers that had up to jump? This is kind of what it feels like because I'm using up on the joystick to jump rather than a button. Which, if that's the case, that means the very first platform game that had jumping used the joystick up to jump because uh, every other thing we've seen, nothing's been... Uh, nothing's had us jump from the side view. So really cool, but yeah, if you notice that the, the joystick's moving me up and down, I, I, like this is me moving up and down on the joystick. That's how the jumping works, to bounce back and forth. And then I have a, a gun I can shoot in front. Yeah, there we go, I can shoot the, the skulls. And land on the clouds is fun. It's interesting, it's using the same background we first saw with Galaxian, that Starfield background, but it's doing it a little different. Oh, nice, we can shoot the bad guys too. So all the all, all the jokers can be shot ahead of time. I'm focused on trying to get the points as the the money bags. Yeah, you can bounce on the clouds. That's awesome. I keep forgetting that it's a shooter because I'm having so much fun jumping. Can I get that guy on the bottom? Yeah, there we go. Oh, okay. So if you don't keep shooting them, then they'll they'll, they'll, they'll wipe you out. <laughs> oh, they're increase Oh, they're actually adding platform. Oh man, look at that. So all at the bottom is enemies, and so you have to platform from cloud to cloud. No, and if they're on the the, the cloud, you have to shoot them off before. <laughs> okay, so I want to get by them. They even gave me some invincibility frames. Whenever I was clearing, I noticed that they didn't kill me right off the bat. I don't know what I'm jumping over, though. Are those jellyfish? But it's uh, timing-based. Oh, we got a volcano now. Awesome. And a, a, a jester just showed up out of nowhere. Yeah, we have volcano uh, exploding while I'm uh, jumping around. So it's auto-jumping, auto-scrolling. So if I get to the ground, I'm not hitting jump. It's doing it for me right there. I didn't do a thing. It, it, right now it's jumping by itself. I'm not doing anything. I don't know what, don't know what this is. Whoa, okay, so it looked like a bonus round. Let's see if I can keep going. I can. No way, it's scrolling down too? Whoa, I wasn't expecting that. Okay, so I thought it was going to horizontally scroll the whole time. Oh my gosh. Okay, so that kicks it up a lot. That's pretty impressive. Alright, got further than I did last time. Let's try one more because uh, this is an, we're getting more and more games that have more content, more game modes, or something that changes up instead of just a few seconds and you can what you see is what you get. Alright, so let's put another coin in and push and start on Jump Bug. Way cooler than Herbie. Let's go. Yeah, the gameplay is so much fun. And a game that I've never heard of or played before. And it, it first took me a while to get used to it because I'm used to pushing a button to jump and this one doesn't do that. It's also tricky because the colors of objects kind of look like the other objects. So like while I'm jumping, I have to pay attention that, oh, I can't do, go down there because there's a joker that'll, uh, that I'm not, not supposed to land on. Kind of like uh, when, it's, when it's a good time to land and when it's not a good time. It's a little tricky with the colors because color palette is simplified, but no, nothing, nothing to fault the game. This is pretty much part of the course for the time. Oh, <laughs> he doubled back on me. I didn't think he was going to do that. See right there, you have to platform on the clouds to make it over those guys. But they're gonna give me some invincibility frames right here. Yeah, the only thing I can see Moon Patrol would have on this is the uh, uh, scrolling background. Because the Starfield kind of doesn't count. The multi-layered scrolling was what you know Moon Patrol had that was going for it. And then we go into the volcanoes. It feels like I'm on the moon, though. Like I'm floating while driving a bug. 
Okay, cool. Looks good. No, don't let the jester get me. Please. Oh my gosh. Man, it is so much fun to try to go for the high score on this. We played a lot of games, and a lot of them are fun getting the high score, but this one, something special about Jump Bug. All right, there you go. They're turning evil, and now, after I get the, the money, then they turn evil, and now, yes, we're scrolling down, and we got a bird chasing me. I don't, I can't see down below, so I actually don't know what's going to happen. Oh, I landed on spikes, but it didn't hurt me. Whoa, now we're going back up. It's pointing to the exit up here, so now I jump back up. So it's like I'm playing a um, a scrolling adventure game uh, from room to room. <laughs> and then that's it. I guess it ended the level. It's, it's, it's driving by itself. I have no control over this part. But we get music at the end too? Wow. Now is it repeat ad nauseum? Is my guess. Looks like... No, it's a slightly different. It's not the exact same thing. But, um... Wow, okay, yeah. It, this is this is a blast to play. Using the joystick to control, like, this floating car it feels awesome. And it's something we haven't experienced before. No! Oh, nice. Now we're underwater? Okay. I don't know what we're set for um, a new player. Like, if we can keep going to get a new player. Okay, that's pretty cool. The uh, jellyfish animation reminds me of uh, uh, Life Force or Salamander vibes. Uh, the, the the tentacle graphics there. Wow, okay. Yeah, very creative, very interesting. Man, see, it's getting harder and harder to give these games ratings because we're seeing so many good things. So this one um, d does so many things well. Uh, it's definitely above average. And considering what the, the other arcade games we played, um, sound effects are excellent. The the, te the, the te technical aspect of the scrolling uh, around is, is fantastic. Uh, the way it plays, like the jump mechanic, I got to give it high marks for the jump. The jump mechanic is really, really good. And I can't deny how well... Man. Now I feel like I'm giving too many five stars. But the, the reason we're doing the rate, I want to do the rating system is to rate the games based on everything else we've seen up to this point and, and kind of get like a, a slow burn of the evolution of video games. So like we see a, a shooter with Space Invaders and I'm like, oh, this is, this is brand new. This is so good. Five stars for Space Invaders. But then when we get something that pushes what Space Invaders does beyond what it is, then Galaxian, five stars because of how well it made something new. And this is a whole new concept, man. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go five stars again. Jump Bug is is too good to. It, it's it's one of the best games you could play in the arcades uh, with that jump mechanic because we haven't played any games where you could scroll sideways and jump at the same time. <laughs> yep, and I see 4.5. I, I am with you, because I'm I'm thinking of all the other five star games we played: Defender, Frogger, and 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 games that. Uh, I guess I can't give it five because it's not as iconic, but it's still the first game we ever played side view that could jump and, and controlled well. So I'm still going to go five for Jump Bug. I know it's a lot of fives, but it's it's just too good. It's too good. All right, so after Jump Bug, what is our next game? All right, this is Lock and Chase. So we're still in the arcades. Great place to be in 1981, golden age of arcade games. Let's take a look at the artwork for... Lock and Chase. Looks like this is another Deco Cassette System game, which means we may have to fast forward when it loads. Watch out. Close the shutter. It's Lupin versus the Super DS. Wait, Lupin? Is that Lupin? Is it like a chibi version of Lupin? <laughs> we played another Lupin arcade game, and I wonder if this is supposed to be based on the Lupin anime. Yeah, hilarious advertisement flyer. Yeah, we're trying to get away with the cash. So there's another advertisement flyer. It's a game of cops and robbers where you collect the loot. Lupin, that meanie madcap is after all the gold coins and riches scattered on the pathways of the maze. Okay, so it's Taito. I think Taito did one before. So is the Lock and Chase uh, a chibi version of Lupin the Third? Is that what it's meant to be? Because it uh, looks like it was originally programmed in Japan by Taito. So you get all the coins, exit the maze, go to another... 
Arian try again to outwit the detectives who are hot on the trail, even more devious in the chase. Collecting the hat, crown, valise, and telephone in successive mazes earns bonus bonus points. And there's our arcade cabinet for lock and chase. With a PCB. And for controls, we got a joystick and the lock button. Yeah, we're going to lock the doors on this one. Oh, did it say M network back there? Let's see. I didn't see it on that, that part. Yeah, so controls, just move around and lock it up. There's our arcade marquee for lock and chase. And an example of the screenshot. Let's take a look at the manual for lock and chase. This is the arcade operator manual. Yes, Taito. Another big developer at the time for 1981. Looks like we have a uh, setup, introduction, game inspection... Uh, I guess introduction is going to be... If you notice, these manuals for the operator is, has a lot of stuff that is uh, very technical. Here we go. Lock and Chase. Upright game manufactured by Taito. Object of the game is to maneuver with a joystick. The Lupin... I guess Lupin's in quotes, so maybe it's not the official like Lupin the Third. Through the maze, dodging and pursuing Super D. Along the pathway, collect as many coins as possible and earn additional bonus points. When all coins are picked up along the pathway, a door will open and you must guide your Lupin your Lupin through the escape uh, through escaping to the next screen. The lock buttons provided which close shutters, helping to stall Super D and sometimes trapping them. Treasures appear along the pathway. If picked up, additional bonus points are scored. When all credits Lupins are arrested, the game is over. And there we go. The rest is very technical about setting up the arcade cabinet. Let's see what additional versions we have. Yeah, we have the De Deco Cassette. Oh, it's an optional version. So hopefully we'll boot up the version that is not the Deco Cassette. All right, this is J June 19th, 1981, and we're playing Lock and Chase in the arcades by Data East. Yes, okay, so no Deco Cassette system. It booted right up. Oh, M Network for, for Atari. Gotcha. <laughs> yes, the, the company that brought it to the Atari 2600. This is the first release in the arcades. And we got all the artwork around the CRT screen for us. And over on the left side, very hard to see. There's instructions, which, you know, put a coin in and explain how to play, which we saw before. But the attract mode is adorable. Lupin is adorable. And it's playing like a top-down maze game, playing off the uh, Pac-Man vibes that we saw by Namco. <laughs> Where you collect all the coins, i.e. dots, on the screen. Once you get all the coins, then you move on to the next one. There's the Super D nickname. See, they're playing off the... Uh, uh, the mechanic of Pac-Man. Stiffy, Smarty, Scaredy, and Silly are the names of all the Super Ds. So it's like the ghosts in Pac-Man. Is there a way to... I guess, is it only the locking doors? Or is there another way we, we can get rid of them whenever we play? Yeah, it's the cops. Super D. All right, let's put a coin in and see what it's like. Best five players get scores on there and push and start here we go first time checking out lock and chase <laughs> so lupin shows up and then yeah you move around automatically just like pac-man feels fantastic and i have where's my lock button there it is uh, and they already got me that fast looks like you can only lock two at once did they say that anywhere in the instructions no they just talk about how to pick up the coins or treasure but any doorway, it looks like you can lock them, and we have places that will lock themselves. Oh, I want to get the treasure. <laughs> I don't know how to lock the door I want, because I want to lock the door south of me. There's only one button, so it's uh, when you pass by the door, that's the one you'll lock. So you really have to plan out a strategy for where you're going to move next. Oh, we got a hat we can pick up? Nice. Oh yeah, I need to lock more doors. Lupin's going down way too fast. Game over. Oh, that's cool. So to put your name in, you get to move Lupin around. <laughs> and he takes the letter and moves it down. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's so charming. And different than what we've seen. They're getting more creative on how to put their score in. Oh, can I put more? No, that's it. After three, after your initials, that's it. Three for the initials. All right, so going again. Another quarter, push and start for lock and chase. Come on, Lupin, let's go. 
All right, so let's see how many we can lock. I want to lock that one, and that one, and that one. Oh. So there's a time limit on the locked doors, and I can only lock two at once. No, I just got lucky there. I don't know how I got through that. Oh, I almost got locked in uh, by the automatic doors. So the once you lock a door, then that's... <laughs> and they closed me on that one. It slowly deteriorates until you can lock another one, but you only can have two at a time on the screen. I want to get to the next one to see if they do what Pac-Man does, which is the exact same maze every time, and then just speed up the ghosts or police officers. Okay, here we go. Let's see. All right, let's get a better, better handle on the stuff up top here and try that one there. Oh, I don't want to close that one. So I got two. I can't use any doors right now. No! And you got to... Oh, he's fast, though. Oh, my gosh. Okay, there we go. Locked him out of that one. This is tight. Oh, he didn't go to the left. Good. So whoever the Super D on the left is, he's he's crazy hard. He moves faster than the other guys. Come on. Just gotta make my way up here, guys. Don't mind me. I'm stealing all the loot. Oh, wait. Oh, I gotta escape, too. I didn't know that. I'm used to Pac-Man where it just ends. Yes! <laughs> and the police officers cry. Way to go, Taito. This game is so charming. Big appeal. Okay, just like I thought with Pac-Man, it's using the same maze every single time, and they're going to speed up and yeah, uh, make the difficulty harder for the policeman. Oh, so maybe they're referring to that, because he's cute like a bean. <laughs> he does look beanish. This begins our many, many uh, copycats of Pac-Man. We're going to see a lot. I did not want to close that one. Come on. All right, let's see if I can get away from these guys. Yeah, really cool mechanic. It's There's no power pellets or anything like in, in Pac-Man. Are they going to be smart? Oh, he's smart enough to go around. Okay. But it's based on timing. Yeah, this is great. There we go. Lock that one in. And now they should be able to get fast on this side. So you can use the automatic gates to help you. And if you read the automatic gates, you'll know what, what's going to happen with them. Uh-oh, not looking good. Uh... <laughs> no, Lupin, no. Game over. And this is awesome. He actually takes the letter and goes down and does it for you. <laughs> so much fun. Okay, so let's end this one. Way to go, Lupin. All right, we're going to go again because it is a, a blast to play. It's taking that formula of Pac-Man and uh, not giving you the, the out with the power pellet. So it has you think a little bit smarter and pay attention to the map more. Because the, the gates closing changes the layout. Almost like if we're getting a different maze every time, which is kind of cool. And still got to pick up all the dots. Got to get your treasure. Oh, wow. See, there we go. Looking good. Can't come get me. See if we can block these guys there. Oh, get my hat. That's it. And I love it when we get these arcade games where we can see the artwork as if we're in the arcade, like around the, the cabinet. No! <laughs> no! I don't... <laughs> that red guy goes a little bit faster. And throws you off. So it's... Oh, I forget the guy's name. They give us all the nicknames like the, the ghosts in Pac-Man. Stinky, Blinky, and Clyde. But I forget their names. By the way, the version we're playing now was first released in Japan at this time. Oh, no. Am I locked in? <laughs> so the very first people that played Lock and Chase by Taito, uh, they were in Japan. Okay, here we go. Trying it again. Give me that one coin, and I'll be on my way, and then I just need to get over to that side. 
Let's see what they do. Okay, I think we got it. But now we gotta escape. Yes, the out. Can we get out? Looks like... Yes. <gasps> okay, he didn't go down. We got it. <laughs> and Lupa does a dance. It kind of reminds me of Kirby. Every time he finishes a level, he does a dance. It's the same kind of effect. Same concept. Bouncing up and down, being a bean. Oh, and they closed in on me. Sometimes those automatic doors help you. Sometimes they hinder you. All right, so we won't put the score in for this one. Uh, excellent run still, and very fun. So that was Lock and Chase, and for the time, uh, it's not as high as a five as far as something that's pushing the best game we've ever played. It's obviously taken the inspiration from Pac-Man, but it is up there. It is very fun. And the maze game, I'm not going to say just because they're using the same concept, it's not a good game. It, it's still taking something from Pac-Man and doing something very well. Oh, I see, I'm, I'm getting three and a half in, in the chat, which is above average. I was going to go for four for Lock and Chase. It is using the same maze map at the top, but um, yeah, I can see three and a half as well. It is above average. It's it's not something typical that you see, considering we have a, a, a slew of shooters that are out there. We're going to go four stars uh, for Lock and Chase, considering the... Um, uh, the character design. So uh, we were going to see other maze games that are very basic, but Lupin's pretty good. And then uh, the mechanic with the, the gates closing almost makes it feel like you're playing a different uh, maze every time because you're having to adjust it. You're, you're, you're putting the walls up for it. All right, so that was Lock and Chase in the arcade. Whatever else could be our next game. Our next release is the newest Game & Watch, and this is Parachute. Let's take a look at the artwork for Parachute. The newest release, and it should be still, yes, a gold version of it. Something that's unique about the Game & Watch series is it's widescreen. There is there is no other game that we played so far on the channel that is widescreen. I know it's in the palm of your hand and, you know, it's using LCD graphics, but it is the only widescreen game we've seen thus far. And it looks like there's other ones that we haven't seen yet. We haven't seen Octopus or Popeye or Chef yet on the looking at the back of the box. So there's the example of the system itself. Let's see what other versions. Yeah, we're going to load this one up. I think it looks a little bit better. But it's June 19th, 1981. And this is Parachute for the Game & Watch. So pretty simple of how it works. Uh, you got Game A and Game B and then Time because it's a Game & Watch. And if you can see, I can move left and right on the screen. And it's adjusting the time too. So you have two buttons on either side. Let's start with Game A and see what it's like. And this is it. This is a super blown up. Uh, oh, I missed. <laughs> no, he gets chased by a shark. Oh, that's fun. Better miss animation. They've gotten more and more creative and clever at Nintendo with this. So keep in mind, the only things we've seen by Nintendo at this point is the Game & Watch for the handheld. And then we've seen a few releases in the arcades, and that's it. And it is before Donkey Kong, which is coming at some point. I'm, I'm, I'm expecting and excited for Donkey Kong, but we haven't seen it in the arcades yet. We've seen other... Arcade games, notably the last one was Radar Scope, which I've been told was not selling well, and they had to turn around Radar Scope into something else, uh, make it into uh, Donkey Kong. And that's where we got it, because Radar Scope bombed. They quickly switched the PCB out and made some adjustments. Yeah, so this is, this is, this is great. Perfectly average. <laughs> oh, we get the sharks indicate how many people we've missed. It's doing what... It's doing what the other Game & Watch games is, which is uh, a, a great time waster, and uh, it's just based on when things come, show up on the screen, how quickly you can react to it. All right, so let's check out Game B. You'll see if that one's any different. Let me switch it up. What is Game B? Okay, let's try that. Oh, it looks like it's not responding after that. You only get one game for the emulator, and then you're done after that. <laughs> We've seen the difference between game A and game B just means harder, more difficult. But uh, still, for the, for the time, that's very average for what we've seen. I'd give it, it's charming for the whole shark animation, but uh, that's it. It's, it's, it's just that one game for what you usually play. I'm not going to go any higher because for other handhelds, we've seen interchangeable cartridges and Milton Bradley handhelds and more advanced handhelds. It is charming, simple to use, but... Um, Yes, there are 60 Game & Watches. We're going to play all Game & Watches. Even the, the uh, upright ones. The They had some Game & Watches that weren't just in the palm of your hand. Kind of like the Coleco uh, tabletop 
uh, ones. They had Game & Watches for those, too. But uh, I'm going to give it average. It's uh, it, it's typical handheld we see, and for the Game & Watch, it's very average for what you play, uh, and great way to uh, pass time in 1981. All right, so after that, after Parachute, our next is... Oh, excellent. So our next is the magazine, the Atari Connection. This is the summer 1981 release. Let's take a look and see what the summer of 1981 holds. And that's because that's where we are. We're, we're there in Atari right now. Here's the cover of the Atari Connection. And yes, a bunch of kids around the Atari home computer, which is the 400 or 800. All the ones we've been playing, I just say we play on the 800. But uh, yes, market to the kids. I don't know what's going on with that girl's hair. It is 1981, so maybe that's what they had. But I'd be that kid in the middle right there. Let me push the buttons. Everyone get out of my way and let me let, let me play the game. But of course, it's most likely educational that they're checking out. All right, so we're going to skim by the table of contents because we're going to go right to the, the meat of everything. Looks like we have, uh, yes, conversational French, German, and Spanish that you can do on your home computer. Uh, programming 2 and 3, uh, new services with Telelink. And I pointed this out before. This was a, a, a way you could connect to, with your telephone to get information like uh, you can get Dow Jones stock information or uh, news information to your computer so it's not technically online it's like a, a, a smaller way of putting it but it, it's it's still using your telephone connection to do that which is really cool oh so that was the 400 they had they had the chiclet keyboard not the real the 800 had the real beefy keyboard or more modern keyboard and then we also have a new game you can play called Scram a nuclear power plant simulation kids and I think we're going to see that at some point. We haven't seen it yet, but that's the newest uh, educational game, Scram, a nuclear power uh, power <laughs> simulation game. Oh, nice. We got some envelopes we can scroll through. And then uh, this part here is, yes, learning conversational Spanish on your home. Looks like, yeah, uh, Atari 400 with a cassette uh, drive, the cheaper version of it. Learning Spanish at home. That's awesome. All right, so for new products, we have... Missile Command, yes, going to be coming out for the home computer and for the Atari 2600. So this is a review of Missile Command. You'll be able to play at home for the first time. And then Asteroids, which we've seen a few people dabble with their own version of Asteroids that you could play. It, it was very close to Asteroids. And then we're going to get the official Atari version of Asteroids at home as well and on the home computer. We'll be seeing that soon. Don't really care about the Atari Accountant. And then accounting system. You can see there, there, there it is doing their, their accounting right above me in 1981. So cool. And then for new products, we have the Atari Word Processor, which we really don't care about. But here we go. More memory than ever. Atari announces its new 815 dual disk drive. This new disk drive provides you with 356K bytes of double density data storage on two five and a quarter diskettes. Still using five and a quarter diskettes. So you can have a total of 1,424 bytes of storage. Wow. <laughs> Atari 800 computer could do that. And then we have uh, paper ribbon for your printer. Don't care about those. And then this is an article about the Palo Alto Junior Museum exhibit, which is kind of cool. It's a museum exhibit for computers back in 1981. Those are the kids that were on the front. And it's talking about the different exhibits they had where people could play or the, the, the kids could go to the museum and check out computers at the time at the Palo Alto. That's kind of cool. And you can see for education uh, side, they have a rendezvous with the space colony possible on an Atari computer. I don't know what uh, the, the point of this is. I guess to show how cool the Atari computer is and you would want this one rather than the more popular and better selling computer right now, which is the Apple II. All right, so scrolling through this one after the space program, we have some examples of entertainment of what you can do for your sit. So this is ways you can write out sound programs on your Atari home computer, and it will uh, put the sound back. So you can actually play music from your computer, but you have to type it in. So it's going to give us an example on the far left side how to type in sound and have the computer say the sound back and voice and pitch. So um, it's going to give us examples of like notes you can see over uh, over my shoulder, how to play different notes and what value you would put in on your computer. This picture on the left, though, is awesome. They're playing Missile Command on the Atari 400 uh, home computer with the Atari joystick, which I would consider is the, the coolest draw 
to having the Atari home computer rather than the Apple and the other ones, because you could plug in the same controllers on the 2600 on the home computer. It makes the, 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 the best game experience. Okay, so uh, this next part's pretty cool because it's showing us code to type in to make sounds and music. So this is uh, how to loop sounds and do special effect sounds like bouncing ball, jackhammer, running footsteps, ocean, doorbell. And this is how you would program this into your Atari computer. Gunshots, birds, a telephone ring. So you sell it to manual, put it in the code, but it's so cool it has it here. I would totally be doing this in 1981 at my computer, typing everything in, seeing what it sounds like, and you probably get a few seconds of entertainment, but it would, it, it, I would love it. And then we have another program for kids called the Kid Bits Program. And this is stuff you can type in. I'm guessing the kids didn't type it in. The adults did for them, but you have a, a light and sound show right here. It's kind of hard to see because of the, the picture they chose, but you just take some acid and then uh, check out a light show on your Atari computer. Have a blast. It's 1981. There's a countdown program, and then they have different things that they have for kids, like, uh, uh, yeah, the Kids Bit Special, different programs you can use. And then they have a kids section uh, with a word search. <laughs> and this one is very interesting. This article is about the computer entering the music world. And this is, this is big because the next computer, or the big one that Atari is going to release, is the Atari ST. That one was known as a music powerhouse. And so it's funny that they're talking about Atari entering the comp the music world with the 400 and 800. And so this is um, an article about uh, them working with the music industry or trying to push into the music industry for the first time. They will do a lot later with the Atari ST, definitely. And then we have the business professional side. I'm going to breeze by those. And then this one is a great article on if Atari isn't Japanese company, why does it have a Japanese name? So this article is about why it's called Atari when it's not in Japan, not based in Japan. And this is the story of when Nolan Bushnell, uh, I'll kind of breeze through what it says. It's when uh, Nolan Bushnell and um, uh, Ted Dabney were starting up the company, they asked him for what name they wanted to use. And they wanted to use the name Syzygy. But the California Secretary of State said that it's already been taken by another corporation in California. So they said, let's pick uh, D, uh, BD Incorporated. But they were too closely to Black & Decker. So they wanted something different. And so... Um, Bushnell and Dabney were both players of Go, which is a Japanese strategy game, uh, originally from China. And then their best brainstorming always occurred over beer and a good game of Go. So with Go at the, at the moment, they decided to make a list of several Go words that would fly as a new corporate name. So the first on the list was Sinti, which means the upper hand. And then the second choices were Atari, which has a similar meaning as check in chess or Han which is the acknowledgement that you're over going to overtake someone in Go. So Bushnell and Dabney submitted, a, uh, a few weeks later, they submitted Atari, and their first choice uh, what, uh, their first choice was Sinte, but they were d denied. But then they picked Atari as their second, and it, it, it was, it's possible that the whole company could have been named Sinti instead of Atari, which is kind of crazy to think about. And so uh, they kind of put the two of Syzygy and A. So if you look at the Atari symbol right here above my head, that's supposed to be uh, a combination of S and A for Atari as the symbol of where we get the Atari game, so or the Atari company name. So a cool bit of information in, the, in this magazine of the Atari Connection. And the last part of the magazine has Atari talking. And this is how you can say, or get your computer to say words. And it gives you commands. Like how you can, uh, what you can type in to get your computer to talk to you which is so cool for 1981 especially. And that is it. Yeah, that's about it for the Atari connection of summer of 1981. Very exciting information of what we're going to get in the summer and more stuff that we're going to see. We're currently at the end of June or possibly the beginning of July is where we sit right now. So we will see everybody next time. We're going to end for tonight, but we wish everyone the best for 1981 and we'll see everyone next time. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9pm Central, so join us and let us know if you miss any games along the way. This video would not be possible without RetroArch and LaunchBox. Please tell your friends there's some crazy guy out there trying to play every single video game. You can always check out Chronologically Gaming on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Chronological Gaming is the name to look for. We will catch you next time.